Chapter 3 The Madness from the Sea If heaven ever wishes to grant me a boon, it will be a total effacing of the results of a mere chance which fixed my eye on a certain stray piece of shelf paper. It was nothing on which I would naturally have stumbled in the course of my daily round, for it was an old number of an Australian journal, the Sydney Bulletin, for April 18th, 1925. It had escaped even the cutting bureau, which had at the time of its issuance been avidly collecting material for my uncle's research. I had largely given over my inquiries into what Professor Angell called the Cthulhu cult, and was visiting a learned friend in Patterson, New Jersey the curator of a local museum and a mineralogist of note. Examining one day the reserved specimens roughly set on the storage shelves in a rear room of the museum, my eye was caught by an odd picture in one of the old papers spread beneath the stones. It was the Sydney Bulletin I have mentioned, for my friend had wide affiliations in all conceivable foreign parts, and the picture was a half-toned cut of a hideous stone image almost identical with that which Legrasse had found in the swamp. Eagerly clearing the sheet of its precious contents, I scanned the item in detail, and was disappointed to find it of only moderate length. What it suggested, however, was a portentous significance to my flagging quest, and I carefully tore it out for immediate action. It read as follows. Mystery derelict found at sea. Vigilant arrives with helpless armed New Zealand yacht in tow. One survivor and dead man found aboard. Tale of desperate battle and deaths at sea. Rescued seaman refuses particulars of strange experience. Odd idol found in his possession. Inquiry to follow. The Morrison Company's freighter Vigilant bound from Valparaiso, arrived this morning at its wharf in Darling Harbor, having in tow the battled and disabled but heavily armed steam yacht Alert of Dunedin, New Zealand, which was sighted April 12th in south latitude 34 degrees 21 minutes, west longitude 152 degrees 17 minutes, with one living and one dead man aboard. The vigilant left Valparaiso March 25th, and on April 2nd was driven considerably south of her course by exceptionally heavy storms and monster waves. On April 12th the derelict was sighted, and though apparently deserted, was found upon boarding to contain one survivor in a half-delirious condition, and one man who had evidently been dead for more than a week. The living man was clutching a horrible stone idol of unknown origin about a foot in height, regarding whose nature authorities at Sydney University, the Royal Society, and the museum in College Street all profess complete bafflement, and which the survivor says he found in the cabin of the yacht in a small carved shrine of common pattern. This man, after recovering his senses, told an exceedingly strange story of piracy and slaughter. He is Gustav Johansson, a Norwegian of some intelligence, and had been second mate of the two-masted schooner Emma of Auckland, which sailed for Kalau February 20th with a complement of eleven men. The Emma, he says, was delayed and thrown widely south of her course by the great storm of March 1st, and on March 22nd, in south latitude 49 degrees 51 minutes, west longitude 128 degrees 34 minutes, encountered the alert, manned by a queer and evil-looking crew of Kanakas and half-castes. Being ordered peremptorily to turn back, Captain Collins refused, whereupon the strange crew began to fire savagely and without warning upon the schooner, with a peculiarly heavy battery of brass cannon forming part of the yacht's equipment. The Emma's men showed fight, says the survivor, and though the schooner began to sink from shots beneath the waterline, they managed to heave alongside their enemy and board her, grappling with the savage crew on the yacht's deck, 
and being forced to kill them all, the number being slightly superior because of their particularly abhorrent and desperate, though rather clumsy, mode of fighting. Three of the Emma's men, including Captain Collins and First Mate Green, were killed, and the remaining eight under Second Mate Johansen proceeded to navigate the captured yacht, going ahead in their original direction to see if any reason for their ordering back had existed. The next day, it appears, they raised and landed on a small island, although none is known to exist in that part of the ocean, and six of the men somehow died ashore, though Johansen is queerly reticent about this part of the story and speaks only of their falling into a rock chasm. Later, it seems, he and one companion boarded the yacht and tried to manage her, but were beaten about by the storm of April 2nd. From that time till his rescue on the 12th, the man remembers little, and he does not even recall when William Brighton, his companion, died. Brighton's death reveals no apparent cause and was probably due to excitement or exposure. Cable advices from Dunedin report that the alert was well known there as an island trader and bore an evil reputation along the waterfront. It was owned by a curious group of half-castes whose frequent meetings and night trips to the woods attracted no little curiosity, and it had set sail in great haste just after the storm and earth tremors of March 1st. Our Auckland correspondent gives the Emma and her crew an excellent reputation, and Johansen is described as a sober and worthy man. The Admiralty will institute an inquiry on the whole matter beginning tomorrow, at which every effort will be made to induce Johansen to speak more freely than he has done hitherto. This was all, together with a picture of the hellish image. But what a train of ideas it started in my mind. Here were new treasuries of data on the Cthulhu cult and evidence that it had strange interest at sea as well as on land. What motive prompted the hybrid crew to order back the Emma as they sailed about with their hideous idol? What was the unknown island on which six of the Emma's crew had died, and about which the mate Johansen was so secretive? What had the Vice Admiralty's investigation brought out, and what was known of the noxious cult in Dunedin? And, most marvellous of all, what deep and more than natural linkage of dates was this which gave him a line and now undeniable significance to the various turns of events so carefully noted by my uncle? March 1st, or February 28th, according to the international dateline, the earthquake and storm had come. From Dunedin, the alert and her noisome crew had darted eagerly forth as if imperiously summoned, and on the other side of the earth, poets and artists had begun to dream of a strange, dank, cyclopean city, whilst a young sculptor had moulded in his sleep the form of the dreaded Cthulhu. March 23rd, the crew of the Emma landed on an unknown island and left six men dead, and on that date the dreams of sensitive men assumed a heightened vividness and darkened with dread of a giant monster's malign pursuit, whilst an architect had gone mad and a sculptor had lapsed suddenly into delirium. And what of this strange storm of April 2nd, the date on which all dreams of the dank city ceased and Wilcox emerged unharmed from the bondage of strange fever? What of all this, and of those hints of old Castro about the sunken, star-born old ones and their coming reign, their faithful cult and their mastery of dreams? Was I tottering on the brink of cosmic horrors beyond man's power to bear? If so, they must be horrors of the mind alone, for in some way the second of April had put a stop to whatever monstrous menace had begun its siege of mankind's soul. That evening, after a day of hurried cabling and arranging, I bade my host adieu and took a train for San Francisco. In less than a month I was in Dunedin, 
where, however, I found that little was known of the strange cult members who had lingered in the old sea taverns. Waterfront scummel was far too common for special mention, though there was vague talk about one inland trip those mongrels had made, during which faint drumming and red flame were noted on the distant hills. In Auckland I learned that Johansen had returned with yellow hair turned white after a perfunctory and inconclusive questioning at Sydney, and had thereafter sold his cottage in West Street and sailed with his wife to his old home in Oslo. Of his stirring experience he would tell his friends no more than he had told the Admiralty officials, and all they could do was to give me his Oslo address. After that I went to Sydney and talked profitlessly with seamen and members of the Vice Admiralty Court. I saw the alert, now sold and in commercial use, at Circular Quay in Sydney Cove, but gained nothing from its non-committal bulk. The crouching image, with its cuttlefish head, dragon body, scaly wings and hieroglyph pedestal, was preserved in the museum at Hyde Park and I studied it long and well, finding it a thing of balefully exquisite workmanship, and with the same utter mystery, terrible antiquity, and unearthly strangeness of material which I had noted in the grass's smaller specimen. Geologists, the curator told me, had found it a monstrous puzzle, for they vowed that the world held no rock like it, and I thought with a shudder of what old Castro had told the grass about the old ones. They had come from the stars, and had brought their images with them. Shaken with such a mental resolution as I had never before known, I now resolved to visit mate Johansen in Oslo. Sailing for London, I re-embarked at once for the Norwegian capital and one autumn day landed at the trim wharves in the shadow of the Egeberg. Johansen's address, I discovered, lay in the old town of King Harald Hardrada, which kept alive the name of Oslo during all the centuries that the greater city masqueraded as Christiana. I made the brief trip by taxicab and knocked with palpitant heart at the door of a neat and ancient building with plastered front. A sad-faced woman in black answered my summons, and I was stung with disappointment when she told me, in halting English, that Gustav Johansen was no more. He had not long survived his return, said his wife, for the doings at sea in 1925 had broken him. He had told her no more than he told the public, but had left a long manuscript of technical matters, as he said, written in English, evidently in order to guard her from the peril of casual perusal. During a walk through a narrow lane near the Gothenburg dock, a bundle of papers falling from an attic window had knocked him down. Two Lascar sailors at once helped him to his feet, but before the ambulance could reach him, he was dead. Physicians found no adequate cause of the end, and laid it to heart trouble and a weakened constitution. I now felt gnawing at my vitals that dark terror which will never leave me till I too am at rest, accidentally or otherwise. Persuading the widow that my connection with her husband's technical matters was sufficient to entitle me to his manuscript, I bore the document away and began to read it on the London boat. It was a simple, rambling thing, a naive sailor's effort at a post-facto diary, and strove to recall day by day that last awful voyage. I cannot attempt to transcribe it verbatim in all its cloudiness and redundance, but I will tell its just enough to show why the sound of water against the vessel's sides became so unendurable to me that I stopped my ears with cotton. Johansen, thank God, did not know quite all, even though he saw the city and the thing. But I shall never sleep calmly again when I think of the horrors that lurk ceaselessly behind life in time and in space, 
and of those unhallowed blasphemies from elder stars which dream beneath the sea, known and favored by a nightmare called ready and eager to loose them upon the world whenever another earthquake shall heave their monstrous stone city again to the sun and air. Johansson's voyage had begun just as he told it to the vice-admiralty. The Emma, in ballast, had cleared Auckland on February 20th, and had felt the full force of that earthquake-borne tempest which must have heaved up from the sea-bottom the horrors that filled men's dreams. Once more under control, the ship was making good progress when held up by the alert on March 22nd, and I could feel the mate's regret as he wrote of her bombardment and sinking. Of the swarthy cult fiends on the alert he speaks with significant horror, there was some peculiarly abominable quality about them which made their destruction seem almost a duty, and Johansen shows ingenuous wonder at the charge of ruthlessness brought against his party during the proceedings of the court of inquiry. Then, driven ahead by curiosity in their captured yacht under Johansen's command, the men sight a great stone pillar sticking out of the sea and in south latitude 47 degrees 9 minutes, west longitude 123 degrees 43 minutes, come upon a coastline of mingled mud, ooze, and weedy cyclopean masonry, which can be nothing less than the tangible substance of Earth's supreme terror, the nightmare corpse city of Relia, that was built in measureless aeons behind history, by the vast, loathsome shapes that seeped down from the dark stars. There lay great Cthulhu and his hordes, hidden in green, slimy vaults and sending out at last, after cycles incalculable, the thoughts that spread fear to the dreams of the sensitive and called imperiously to the faithful to come on a pilgrimage of liberation and restoration. All this Johansen did not suspect, but God knows he soon saw enough. I suppose that only a single mountain top, the hideous monolith crowned citadel whereon great Cthulhu was buried, actually emerged from the waters. When I think of the extent of all that may be brooding down there, I almost wish to kill myself forthwith. Johansen and his men were awed by the cosmic majesty of this dripping Babylon of elder demons, and must have guessed without guidance that it was nothing of this or of any sane planet. Awe at the unbelievable size of the greenish stone blocks, at the dizzying height of the great carven monolith, and the stupefying identity of the colossal statues and bas-reliefs with the queer image found in the shrine on the alert is poignantly visible in every line of the mate's frightened description. Without knowing what futurism is like, Johansen achieved something very close to it when he spoke of the city, for instead of describing any definite structure or building, he dwells only on broad impressions of vast angles and stone surfaces, surfaces too great to belong to anything right or proper for this earth, and impious with horrible images and hieroglyphs. I mention this talk about angles because it suggests something Wilcox had told me of his awful dreams. He said that the geometry of the dream place he saw was abnormal non-Euclidean, and loathsomely redolent of spheres and dimensions apart from ours. Now an unlettered seaman felt the same thing whilst gazing at the terrible reality. Johansen and his men landed on a sloping mud bank on this monstrous acropolis, and clambered slipperily up over titan oozy blocks which could have been no mortal staircase. The very sun of heaven seemed distorted when viewed through the polarizing miasma welling out from the sea-soaked perversion. 
and twisted menace and suspense lurked leeringly in those crazily elusive angles of carven rock where a second glance showed concavity after the first showed convexity. Something very like fright had come over all the explorers before anything more definite than rock and ooze and weed was seen. Each would have fled had he not feared the scorn of the others, and it was only half-heartedly that they searched, vainly as it proved, for some portable souvenir to bear away. It was Rodriguez, the Portuguese, who climbed up the foot of the monolith and shouted of what he'd found. The rest followed him and looked curiously at the immense carved door with the now familiar squid dragon bar relief. It was, Johansson said, like a great bar door, and they all felt that it was a door because of the ornate lintel, threshold, and jams around it. Although they could not decide whether it lay flat like a trap door or slatwise like an outside cellar door. As Wilcox would have said, the geometry of the place was all wrong. One could not be sure that the sea and the ground were horizontal. Hence the relative position of everything else seemed phantasmally variable. Bryden pushed at the stone in several places without result. Then Donovan felt over it delicately around the edge, pressing each point separately as he went. He climbed interminably along the grotesque stone molding. That is, one would call it climbing if the thing was not, after all, horizontal. And the men wondered how any door in the universe could be so vast. Then, very softly and slowly, the acre-great lintel began to give inward at the top, and they saw that it was balanced. Donovan slid, or somehow propelled himself down or along the jam, and rejoined his fellows, and everyone watched the queer recession of the monstrously carven portal. In this fantasy of prismatic distortion, it moved anomalously in a diagonal way so that all the rules of matter and perspective seemed upset. The aperture was black with a darkness almost material. That tenebrousness was indeed a positive quality, for it obscured such parts of the inner walls as ought to have been revealed and actually burst forth like smoke from its aeon-long imprisonment, visibly darkening the sun as it slunk away into the shrunken and gibbous sky on flapping membranous wings. The odor rising from the newly opened depths was intolerable, and at length the quick-eared Hawkins thought he heard a nasty slopping sound down there. Everyone listened, and everyone was listening still when it lumbered slobberingly into sight and gropingly squeezed its gelatinous green immensity through the black doorway into the tainted outside air of that poisoned city of madness. Poor Johansson's handwriting almost gave out when he wrote of this. Of the six men who never reached the ship, he thinks too perished of pure fright in that accursed instant. The thing cannot be described. There is no language for such abysms of shrieking and immemorial lunacy, such eldritch contradictions of all matter, force, and cosmic order. A mountain walked or stumbled. God, what wonder that across the earth a great architect went mad, and poor Wilcox raved with fever in that telepathic instant. The thing of the idols, the green, sticky spawn of the stars, had awaked to claim his own. The stars were right again, and what an age-old cult had failed to do by design a band of innocent sailors had done by accident. After virgintillions of years, great Cthulhu was loose again and ravening for delight. 
three men were swept up by the flabby claws before anybody turned. God rest them, if there be any rest in the universe. They were Donovan, Guerrera, and Angstrom. Parker slipped as the other three were plunging frenziedly over endless vistas of green-crusted rock to the boat, and Johansson swears he was swallowed up by an angle of masonry which shouldn't have been there, an angle which was acute but behaved as if it were obtuse. So only Bryden and Johansson reached the boat and pulled desperately for the alert as the mountainous monstrosity flopped down the slimy stones and hesitated, floundering at the edge of the water. Steam had not been suffered to go down entirely despite the departure of all hands for the shore, and it was the work of only a few moments of feverish rushing up and down between wheel and engines to get the alert under way. Slowly, amidst the distorted horrors of that indescribable scene, she began to churn the lethal waters, whilst on the masonry of that charnel shore that was not of earth, the titan thing from the stars slavered and gibbered like polyphemy cursing the fleeing ship of Odysseus. Then, bolder than the storied Cyclops, great Cthulhu slid greasily into the water, and began to pursue with vast, wave-raising strokes of cosmic potency. Bryden looked back and went mad, laughing shrilly as he kept on laughing at intervals till death found him one night in the cabin, whilst Johansson was wandering deliriously. But Johansson had not given out yet. Knowing that the thing could surely overtake the alert until steam was fully up, he resolved on a desperate chance, and setting the engine for full speed, ran lightning-like on deck and reversed the wheel. There was a mighty eddying and foaming in the noisome brine, and as the steam mounted higher and higher, the brave Norwegian drove his vessel head-on against the pursuing jelly which rose above the unclean froth like the stern of a demon galleon. The awful squid head with writhing feelers came nearly up to the bowsprit of the sturdy yacht, but Johansson drove on relentlessly. There was a bursting as of an exploding bladder and slushy nastiness as of a cloven sunfish, a stench as of a thousand open graves, and a sound that the chronicler could not put on paper. For an instant, the ship was befouled by an acrid and blinding green cloud, and then there was only a venomous seething astern, where, God in heaven, the scattered plasticity of that nameless sky spawn was nebulously recombining in its hateful original form, whilst its distance widened every second as the alert gained impetus from its mounting steam. And that was all. After that, Johansson only brooded over the idol in the cabin and attended to a few matters of food for himself and the laughing maniac by his side. He did not try to navigate after the first bold flight, for the reaction had taken something out of his soul. Then came the storm of April 2nd, and a gathering of the clouds about his consciousness. There is a sense of spectral whirling through liquid gulfs of infinity, of dizzying rides through reeling universes on comet's tail, and of hysterical plunges from the pit to the moon and from the moon back again to the pit, all livened by a cachinating chorus of the distorted, hilarious elder gods and the green, bat-winged, mocking imps of Tartarus. Out of that dream came rescue, the vigilant, the vice admiralty court, the streets of Dunedin, and the long voyage back home to the old house by the Egeberg. He could not tell. They would think him mad. He would write of what he knew before death came, but his wife must not guess. 
death would be a boon if only it could blot out the memories. That was the document I read, and now I have placed it in the tin box beside the bas-relief and the papers of Professor Angel. With it shall go this record of mine, this test of my own sanity, wherein is pieced together that which I hope may never be pieced together again. I have looked upon all that the universe has to hold of horror, and even the skies of spring and the flowers of summer must ever afterward be poison to me, but I do not think my life will be long. As my uncle went, as poor Johansen went, so shall I go. I know too much, and the cult still lives. Cthulhu still lives too, I suppose. Again in that chasm of stone which has shielded him since the sun was young. His accursed city is sunken once more, for the vigilance sailed over the spot after the April storm. But his ministers on earth still bellow and prance and slay around idle-capped monoliths and lonely places. He must have been trapped by the sinking whilst within his black abyss, or else the world would by now be screaming with fright and frenzy. Who knows the end? What has risen may sink, and what has sunk may rise. Loathsomeness waits and dreams in the deep, and decay spreads over the tottering cities of men. A time will come, but I must not and cannot think. Let me pray that if I do not survive this manuscript, my executors may put caution before audacity and see that it meets no other eye. End of chapter 3 End of the Call of Cthulhu by H.P. Lovecraft